A related problem is Atwood's machine. In this example, we have two masses hanging from a rope, which is, of course, massless, on a pulley that's also massless and frictionless. This, we're again going to have two sets of Newton's second law equations. However, we don't have any x anywhere on this one. So we just have some of the forces in the y direction for mass 1 is m1 times a1y, and then the same thing for mass 2. And the expressions look the same. The tensions are the same for both masses for the same reason as before, that we have a massless pulley. But again, we have three unknowns, t, a1y, and a2y, and only two equations. We're going to fix it the same way as before because the accelerations are again related by a negative sign. m2 is larger the way I've set this up, so we know that m1 will go up. So it makes sense to let a1y be equal to a, and then a2y will be the negative of that. Now, you don't have to know how this is going to end before you do the problem, because if it turns out that I treated it this way, and this was just a big box full of empty air, and m2 was smaller than m1, what we would find is our acceleration would be negative when we were done. So we're going to say a equals a1y, and that means a2y is the negative of that. And we rewrite our equations like we did before. We get t minus m2g equals negative m2a, and t minus m1g equals m1a. Again, both of these things can be written as uh, in, for, in terms of t, and then we can set the two right sides equal to each other. When we do a little bit more algebra, we get that the acceleration is the difference of the masses divided by the sum of the masses times g. And again, we look at the limiting cases. If m2 is huge, then we end up with a is g, meaning a1y is positive, it goes up, and a2y is negative, so it goes down at negative g, and that's what we'd expect. And if m2 is tiny compared to m1, the acceleration is negative g, so this is a1y dropping, or mass 1 dropping, and a2y is positive g, positive 9.8. We can combine the two problems we've done before into one even more interesting problem where we have mass M1 sitting on a frictionless inclined plane connected by a massless rope that goes over a massless pulley to mass M2 which hangs off of the high end of it. Because we have two separate systems here, we can actually use two separate coordinate systems to make life easier. And we use a system that goes along the plane and perpendicular to it for M1 and the regular up, down, left, right system for M2. The rope and the pulley connect the two systems. So the only one we have to get rid of here is F2x, since M2 has no x forces on it. We're left with this. And we can start with M2 because it's a little bit simpler. The only forces are T and M2g, and their sum has to equal M2a2y. For mass 1, in the x direction, we have t minus m1g sine theta equals m1a1x. Notice that's because the block, the t is pointing in the positive x direction, and the component of m1g along the plane is downward in the negative x direction, trying to slide it down. In the y direction, we get n minus m1g cosine theta equals m1a1y, but again, we know a1y is 0 since m1 can't fly away or dig into the ramp. So we end up with, again, n equals m1g cosine theta. Still true, still not very interesting for us until there's friction. Yet again, we have more unknowns than equations, and we solve that problem again by realizing that a1x and a2y have the same magnitudes. If the block moves up the ramp, we have positive a1x gives us negative a2y. So we can make this same choice again. a equals a1x equals negative a2y. If we had done this with the triangle pointed the other way, so that the small end was on the right and everything was hanging off the left side, what we would have found there is if the block dropped down in the negative direction, the block on the plane would have moved up in the negative direction as well. So in that case, we could have had a equals a1x equals a2y. We wouldn't have had any negative signs there. Anyway, with what we have now, we can rewrite this t minus m2g is m2a2y, 
or T equals M2G minus M2A. For mass 1, T minus M1G sine theta equals M1A1X. We can rewrite that T equals M1G sine theta plus M1A. Yet again, we say that the tensions are equal, so we can equate the right sides of these two equations and rearrange it to get M2 minus M1 sine theta over the sum of the masses, all times G is the acceleration. We can compare this with what we've gotten before because if theta equals zero, that would be the case of block on the table and block hanging off the side. Sine of zero is zero, and our acceleration would reduce to this, which is what we got before in that case. If theta equals 90 degrees, that would be Atwood's machine, and we would get the difference in masses over their sum times g. That's what we got in the Atwood's machine case. Finally, we could do another example of tension where we don't have any pulleys involved. Let's say we have a mass M hanging from three different ropes that are, of course, all massless. Mass M is 17 kilograms. We know the angle that these two ropes, one and two, make with the ceiling. Uh, the angles are 32 degrees and 57 degrees. We want to see if we can find all the tensions. First, the mass can be our system. The forces on it are pretty simple. We've got T3 up and MG down. Since it's not moving, it's just hanging there in space. Its acceleration is zero, so we know T3 minus mg must equal zero, or T3 equals mg, which is about 167 newtons. To find the other things, T1 and T2, we can imagine that instead of the mass being our system, the knot is our system, where the three ropes are connected. The rope is massless, and so the knot also has to be massless, but even if we say it has a mass that we don't know, it doesn't matter because its acceleration will be zero, so the MA on the right will always be zero. So here's our new free body diagram. And note the tensions are all pulling away from the, the knot, even though here T3 was pointing towards the knot because we were interested in M. To get our direction straight, it's helpful to extend these vectors a little bit and see that what we have labeled as phi for T2 is still phi if we use our start from positive X and move counterclockwise convention. On the other hand, for theta, this is theta and this is theta, so that means our direction, as far as we're concerned, is really 180 minus theta. That's what we're going to use for our angle. So, some of the forces in the x direction equals mass of the knot times ax, which is zero, and our x forces are t1 cosine 180 minus theta plus t2 cosine phi. However, cosine 180 minus theta is just negative cosine theta, so we can replace that cosine 180 minus theta by negative cosine theta and take it over to the other side. We get T1 cosine theta equals T2 cosine phi. The y direction, we do the same thing. We just change cosines to sines, and we have the additional y force of T3 pointing downward, so we get a negative T3. For sine, the sine of 180 minus theta is the same as sine of theta. We re rewrite our equation and we get this. We can plug in some numbers. What will we get for phi and theta if we evaluate these cosines and sines? And we get that this will be 0.53 T1 plus 0.839 T2 is 167 newtons. The other equation gives us 0.848 T1 equals 0.544 T2. That's this equation. And we can use this to figure out what T1 is in terms of T2. And we get that T1 is 0.642 times T2. We plug that in. We work back through the equations, do some algebra, and we get that T2 is 141.6 newtons, and T1 is then 90.9 newtons.